Um, thanks for the opportunity to come and talk at uh, the Centre of Excellence um, workshop today. Um, I'm going to talk about Scott Reef. Jamie gave a very nice sort of introduction about where. Let's hold on. See if I can get this to work. No. Anyway, Jamie very nicely showed you where Scott Reef was. And uh, it's, you look very closely off the northwest of Western Australia, there is a dot there that is Scott Reef, which underplays how big it actually is. Um, so Scott Reef is a very large reef. It's about 50 kilometres by about 30 kilometres and has about 460 kilometres of reef. As James spoke about, a lot of that reef actually occurs in this deep water lagoon between about 35 metres and 70 metres and has very high coral cover of quite low diversity. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is these shallow water parts of the reef. Um, the reef has about a 4.5 metre tide, which means that the reef flat comes, it comes out of the water at most uh, low tides. The small sand cay up here and there's also a, a shallow water lagoon up here that's traditionally been full of staghorn corals. The other unique thing that Jamie touched on as well is that due to its remoteness, there's basically no recreational fishing apart from Andrew Hayward at Ames, I think, is probably the biggest impact in terms of recreational fishing. <laughs> um, but, and there's very little, if no, Australian commercial fishing of Scott Reef. However, there is a significant amount of fishing from Indonesian fishermen. In 1974, Australia signed a memorandum of understanding which basically gave all the rights to this area to Australia, but said that Indonesian fishermen, if they come in traditional fishing boats and use traditional methods, can actually come and fish for shark and trochus and trepang or sea cucumbers. And here's an example. I've caught a um, tiger shark here, a reasonable sort of tiger shark, they take a lot of the, they take the fins primarily, but they take some of the meat as well. Um, Ames has a lot of data to show that um, there is a huge impact on the, the shark populations in the area. Um, where are we? Sorry. Um, today, I want to talk about Scott Reef and the, the work that's been done at Scott Reef since 1994 um, in a collaboration or between Ames and Woodside. I want to talk about the disturbances that have happened to Scott Reef since 1994 around bleaching and cyclones. I want to talk a little bit about the recovery of Scott Reef over that time as well and some of the importance of why that reef has actually been able to recover in the faces of these, these disturbances. Just to talk about the monitoring program briefly. Um, back in 1994, AIM set up a long-term monitoring program there over most of the habitats in the shallows from the reef flat down the reef slope. Over 140 permanent transects were set up. These were replicated at, an, at a number of depths and a number of habitats and have been surveyed most years between 1994 and last year. In 1998, as all of you would know in this audience, is that there was an incredibly large bleaching event that wasn't just regional, it was global. And I think this event really actually changed the view of how we need to manage coral reefs from being a local, regional to it's actually a global issue. Pretty much most reef systems or areas in the, in the world were affected by this bleaching, the Indian Ocean in particular. Um, for Western Australia, we actually escaped fairly unscathed apart from Scott Reef. Um, Scott Reef suffered um, incredible bleaching. The water temperatures at Scott Reef reached about 34 degrees in the shallows. The temperature loggers that we had in 16 metres reached 32 degrees for a significant time period. Just to give you an idea of the mortality of Scott Reef, so these are the, the different habitats that we were monitoring at Scott Reef, what their depth were, what their pre-bleaching coral cover was, and what the percent mortality as a result of this event was. So the reef slope in about nine metres suffered about 75% mortality. The lagoon suffered 90% mortality of the corals, the reef crest 83, and so it goes on. <coughs> um, the one area that didn't 
actually bleach and suffer mortality was the deep water habitat that Jamie talked about previously. Those habitats that are in 30 metres and deeper, the water didn't actually change temperature down there at all. <coughs> and what we had was a situation where when we went back, all the branching corals had basically died and the parietids and some of the other massive corals were still bleached and undergoing partial or whole mortality. Soft corals were either bleached, but most of them were just actually a stand of spicules where the soft coral used to be. So hard coral in the reef slope communities dropped by about 70%. Over 80% of acroporids and parietids died. And the coral community went from one that was dominated by branching corals to one dominated by massive, particularly parietid colonies. The other disturbance that's happened at Scott Reef since 1994 is cyclones. Cyclones are something that is, happens in Western Australia every season and they're usually a lot of them and they're usually can be fairly ferocious. Um, here's, a, here's the cyclone tracks for uh, the northwest between 1980 and 1998. If you're a reef in the northwest of Western Australia, you must be able to cope with frequent and severe cyclones. And Scott Reef's not alone in that. There's been five cyclones since 1994 that have passed within 70 kilometres of Scott Reef. In 2006, there was Cyclone Fay, which came from the Northern Territory and passed directly over the top of Scott Reef as a Category 5 cyclone. Wind predictions at that time say that the wind was blowing about 320 kilometres an hour as it went over the top of Scott Reef. This is some of the photos that we took after that event, this boulder used to be on the reef slope and was actually pulled out of the reef and dumped up onto the reef flat. And we had a situation where thousands of boulders, some the size of combi vans, were just thrown up on the reef. Interestingly enough, the impact on the reef was only exposed sites um, and the massive colonies that actually survived the bleaching, a lot of those were actually pulled out of the reef and just thrown up on top of it. So I thought I'd better show some data as well. Um, so this was the reef in 1994, and between 94 and 97, the reef increased in cover slightly. So we've got coral cover down here in years along. The bleaching event occurred, and coral cover, as I showed you before, was severely impacted, along with the green bar down the bottom here is the soft corals, and they equally suffered. We then actually had this rise up. The thing I want just to point out here is these smaller cyclones that came along didn't have any impact really on coral cover at all at the reef that you can see on, at a reef scale. Cyclone Fay actually did have an impact on actually recovery and you can see there's a little bit of a shift there, but it didn't really actually impact on overall coral cover of the reef. It just pulled back the recovery of it a little um, so, in terms of the disturbance of Scott Reef since 1994, we've had the extreme bleaching event in 98, and it's been impacted by five cyclones, four of them hardly at all in terms of what happened to the coral community. Um, and the interesting thing, in 2010, Scott Reef has actually returned to its previous pre-bleaching pre coral cover and community structure. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about how we actually got to that point. So obviously, as you would all know, corals have predominantly a um, larval life stage where they reproduce externally. The ones that Scott Reef do are predominantly broadcast spawners. They spawn, fertilise externally, go through a development cycle, dispersal event, and end up settling back on the reef and grow. And obviously for communities to recover, you either need the growth of the survivors after a disturbance or you need the recruitment and growth of new corals. In Scott Reef's case, given that most corals had actually died, and especially the branching corals had disappeared and in some locations had just disappeared totally, um, it was all reliant on the recruitment and growth of new corals. It's probably a good point to also point out that one of the things about Scott Reef, and there's been a lot of work done by Jim Underwood, 
that's um, been published in the last couple of years looking at um, the reproductive isolation of Scott Reef. Scott Reef is extremely isolated from other reef systems to the North Ashmore Reef and to the South Rolly Shoals. So Scott Reef is very reliant on itself for the reseeding event. So uh, we would predict that when you have a die-off like this, the recruitment rate should also drop. And luckily enough, back in 1996, we actually set up a coral recruitment study at Scott Reef as well, where we deployed terracotta tiles before the annual mass spawning and collected them afterwards, and we could actually analyse these terracotta tiles and get a relative count of recruitment onto the reef. We are lucky enough to be able to do that from 1996, essentially all the way up to 2010, and look to see what effect did these disturbances have on the replenishment cycle of the reef. So this is the coral recruitment graph I showed you previously um, with the big drop from bleaching. One of the other things that we did over this time was to look at the, the number or the size of the adults, and not surprisingly, this is the size of large adult corals through that, that time, and not surprisingly, the bleaching, we lost all the large adult aquaporid corals totally. And when you look at the recruitment rates, so the arrival of these new corals onto the reef, which is these open bar here, what you found is that there was essentially a complete recruitment <coughs> failure for a number of years after the bleaching event. So coral recruitment was up here, it dropped down. These points are actually zero. There was no recruits on the, the tiles. And as the number of large adults has increased, recruitment has actually gone up to its pre-bleaching level. So Scott Reef, because of its isolation in particular, has an extremely strong stock recruitment relationship. One of the things were when we were back here and getting recruitment rates that were actually zero, right, on a reef that had been absolutely decimated by a bleaching event, our prediction was that the reef is going to take decades and decades to recover. We were thinking 2020, 2030, and in all likelihood a bleaching was likely to come along and hit it back before it could ever recover. Um, and that's pretty much summed up there. So we had a um, prediction that in 2002, 2003, that, recru that uh, recovery would be very, very slow. And as I said previously, by 2010, we're actually back to where we were in 1997. This brought us to how can a reef actually do this? With no recruitment, it can actually get back to where it was. So it must have incredibly good survival. So we set up a coral survival experiment. We went and tagged a corumbo, Zacroporus specifera, and a sort of massive, submassive Goniastria, Rediformis or Edwardsii. And we did it at a number of sites. And then we surveyed them annually for four years to understand what was survival and growth really high at Scott Reef. I won't want to go into this graph too much, but what we've essentially got here is our two different groups, the, the Acropora and the um, Goniastria, and then the sites along the bottom and just survival rates. And so the thing I just want you to take home here is that the different colours are different size classes. So the white one bars are actually less than five centimetres, and we go up to the largest size class, which is the end bar there, which is the corals greater than 25 centimetres. Survival rates of even small juvenile corals at Scott Reef is extremely high. Um, so that if a coral can actually settle on the reef, um, metamorphose and start to do its thing, its chances of dying are pretty actually low at Scott Reef, barring cyclones or other disturbances. So for the Goniastrias, we're almost batting 95%, and for, for many of the, the corals and the locations here are the same for their croppers. So very high survival for both the species, extremely high for the Goniastria species, and what it showed is that recovery can happen with low rates of recruitment if juvenile survival and growth is high. So why is that at Scott Reef? So there's one big negative in terms of impacts that are being put on the reef that aren't these episodic disturbances, and that's the Indonesian fishing. They are actually out there fishing a lot for, for shark fin and having an impact on the, the top order predators. 
there's a lot of positives about Scott Reef is that there is no commercial Australian fishing for um, other fish and also the Indonesian fishermen aren't actually removing herbivores or, or those fish. There's pristine water quality so there's no impacts of any coastal processes out there and the fish population is extremely healthy. So if you look at the, this is a graph of herbivore density through time over those years that I talked about for coral recovery. So if you look at between 94 and 97 when there was no disturbances, herbivorous fish basically stayed the same. Major disturbance, coral dye replaced by coralline and turf algae and the herbivorous fish populations responded to that by basically increasing in their their density and as coral has actually started to take over from the turf and coralline algaes, the herbivorous fish have actually dropped as their food type of that has actually decreased. So we've ended up during the period where there's been low coral cover, we've had a real a small amount of macroalgae there, so macroalgae hasn't taken over and there's been a lot of coralline algae which obviously coral larvae like to use as a settlement cue. So Scott Reef has been able to recover relatively quickly from severe temperature induced bleaching even in the face of eight hours of extremely low, eight years of extremely low coral recruitment. And this is primarily because corals grow and survive extremely well at Scott Reef. And if you're a coral and there's no cyclones of bleaching, it's a very good place to live. Um, and this is likely a result of the other citra or the other issues or the other uh, things at Scott Reef not actually having any stress on them. And I say there's some implications for this study about other reef systems in the world that are becoming increasingly exposed to water temperatures, acidification and um, cyclones. Um, and obviously those, those stresses are very difficult to manage and I suppose the take home message from the Scott Reef data is that it's really important that we continually try to minimise other chronic stresses such as overfishing, degraded water quality, um, because if you do, then in situations like Scott Reef, the reef can actually recover extremely quickly, even when things like uh, reproductive isolation are against it. So that's it. Thank you.